so much for being with us today, John. I really appreciate your taking time to talk. I'd like to start just by asking you a couple questions. First of all, what events or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? You know, really, it was it was my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather uh, emigrated from Greece in 1920. He was born in 1900. So I always liked to keep track of, of his age by what year we were in. But my grandfather and I were very, very close to the point where he was probably my best friend when I was growing up. He would talk a lot about issues that were interesting to me, important to me, like making it through the depression, for example. He, he told me a story once about taking time off work, which was unusual, to go to a Sacco and Vanzetti rally. He happened to be in, uh, in a bank, the Frantic Savings and Loan, waiting in line to deposit his paycheck one day when John Dillinger and his gang came in and robbed the bank. So he was always full of really great stories. One of the things that he spoke about regularly was facing life in Greece under Turkish occupation. And then just as the Turks are leaving upon the collapse of, of the Ottoman Empire, the Italians came in, Mussolini's fascist forces, and took the island. So he sort of instilled in me this idea that some things are just right or wrong. Some things are black and white. Not everything has to be a shade of gray. And that really stuck with me. And I, I remember looking back on the stories that he told about his life and seeing how some things really were black and white and that you had to stand up and make a decision. As you made your decisions, which had a significant impact on your life, was your grandfather's voice in the back of your head? Oh, without a doubt. In fact, you know what? After I blew the whistle on the torture program and things just fell apart for me, I actually went to the cemetery where he's buried and stood there and sort of told him what I was going through. What continues to motivate you and guide you and give you courage? You know what? It, it, it's it's the, the many, many people with whom I've become acquainted. It would have been easy for me just to sort of go silent and go about my life, find some job someplace and live happily ever after. But I've come to realize that people depend on me. One of my attorneys told me one time, he said, the thing you have to understand is this is all far bigger than John Kiriakou. He said, people look to you, people respond to you, and you have to embrace it. There's been a cost to that, certainly, a very high cost, but I have embraced it. I give interviews, not just all the time, but multiple interviews each day. I write a, a column for a consortium news. I'm occasionally called on by the Washington Post or the Los Angeles Times to write a column for them. I find myself with something to say and people seem to want to hear it. I know you have children. What types of guidance do you give to your children? You know, I've been very fortunate when it comes to my children. I have five children. I have four boys and a girl. And they range in age through two marriages. They range in age from 27 to nine. Wow. And so when I, when I was arrested after I blew the whistle on the torture program, my oldest son was in college. My second one was in high school. And both of them told me that a professor and a teacher had pulled them aside to say, your dad did the right thing. Don't worry about anybody else here. And then they both had great support from their friends. My younger kids didn't understand really what was happening at the time because they were so young. They were eight, six, and one. But they came to understand it because, well, now they're the two older teenagers and so they've sort of done their own research. But then in the meantime, in the intervening years, I've taken them to events. I take them to Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, their annual event. We've gone to numerous marches in Washington with Code Pink several times. We participated in a demonstration against human trafficking, police violence. They're into it. And I'm proud of them for that. As you were spending your 30 months in prison, what types of things did you think about while you were there? Wow. You know, you have to work hard to not go crazy and you have to work hard to not fall into despair. You know, I had a lot of help. I had a lot of people who wrote to me regularly. You know, on my very first day, in prison, I heard my name called at mail call and a woman from Ringgold, Georgia had sent me a postcard. And it was such a nice gesture that I decided that day that I would respond to every letter that I received. If somebody took time out of their day 
to write to me, I was going to take time out of my day to write to them. And I ended up responding to 7,000 letters from 675 different people. Wow. Uh, and I answered every single one of them. And then you come to realize just how much support you have out there. On top of that, I had Code Pink raising money so that my wife didn't lose the house. Uh, I had Ai Weiwei doing my portrait out of Legos and then offering people free postcards to send to me saying that they had been to the exhibit. It was incredible. Dan Ellsberg writing to me to tell me not to worry. There's life after this experience. It was truly incredible. And then I used what little time I had where I wasn't answering letters to write my second book, which ended up being very therapeutic. What advice do you have for youth activists today? The advice I have is to believe in yourself. Deep down, we all know the difference between right and wrong. And so if something strikes you as just the wrong thing to do, don't do it. On my very first day at the CIA, the first week was a period of briefings, introductory briefings, the head of this department, the head of that department. And we had a, a talk by the head of security. And I remember him saying that we should never do anything that we wouldn't be proud to see on the front page of the Washington Post. I may have been the only person in the room that day that took that to heart. But I really did take it to heart. And I promised myself I would never do anything that I would be ashamed of. Even though I was at the CIA for 15 years, for example, I never took any action that resulted either directly or indirectly in the death of another human being. You know, deep down, we know the difference between right and wrong, and we just have to follow our own sense of morality. So my advice is march, fight, write, demonstrate, petition your elected officials, and don't give up. Thank you so much. I appreciate your taking time. And let's hope that we can go forward with some hope and positivity and, and accountability. Crossed. And accountability. You're exactly right. Fingers crossed. Thank, Thank you. you very much, John. I appreciate it. Great to talk with Pleasure. you.